Hey folks, how's it going? Here we are, Wednesday morning. Wednesdays are actually kind of cool for me, so so you don't care, but I'm going to tell you anyway because that's the way I roll. Okay, so Wednesdays are cool for me because my wife has a half day on Wednesdays. So she works a whole bunch of hours, Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. So she gets a half day on Wednesdays. And so we get like a ton of stuff done. And so it's kind of cool because it marks a halfway point for me for both, you know, the weekend and then us meeting and so forth. So I like Wednesday mornings. All right. So there you go. Hey, let's talk a minute. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about this. I'm getting used to pointing in the right direction. Everything's commercial, laments Plato and Aristotle. Now, just a quick remem- reminder, and I'm going to make sure it works this time. This is not a history class. So, even though we're talking about Plato and Aristotle and so forth. And let me know if that echo is still coming through. I think I fixed that, at least in my processes. Um, Even though we're talking about Aristotle and Plato, this is not a history class. We want to take the concepts that they introduce and think about them in today's terms. Remember, this is foundations of business thought, meaning These are folks who like kind of came up with the ideas that you and I follow every day without thinking about it. And we want to kind of challenge to see if the ideas still hold up or if they're taking us in the right direction, wrong direction, all that good stuff. Okay. So with that, I'm going to push the wrong button and I'm going to come over here. There we go. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, and and jump right into it. Now, a quick heads up, this is going to be a lot of reading today. Um, my thought is, frankly, if I can go over a lot of this stuff today and actually read it with you, then actually that can prevent you from having to do a lot of additional reading. So kind of take note of what topics we're talking about, what concepts we're talking about, and I will have the reading in the slide so you can kind of take a quick note of where you want to look in the reading so that when you do your follow-up work and so forth, you know what we're talking about. All right, to start with, we're going to get some points doing this, and uh, I'll go ahead and get out of the way. Hey, all of you with a birthday on an odd day, I want you to answer this question. You found yourselves on a desert island with several other people. What would you do to ensure that everybody gets what they need to survive? Okay, if your birthday is on an odd day, write aisle and then your answer. If your birthday is on an even day, I want you to write job and then answer the question, you've just started your career, one that will guide you for the rest of your life. What should you consider when deciding what to do as a profession? Okay, so those of you with the birthday on the even day, as it says there, write job, and and then your response to that question, those with a birthday on the odd day, write aisle, and your response to that question, okay? So take a quick note. If you need to take a picture of the slide, take a picture of the slide so you know what we're answering. And then, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, push the wrong button again, and uh, we'll do two minutes on the timer.
Okay, let's uh, take a look at... The, there you are. Let's take a look at this. Um, it looks like all of you have birthdays on even days because you all answered the question around job, which is which is fine. Oh, Zachary is on an odd. All right, all right. So we'll get that. So let's go ahead and and take a look at and why is that not showing up? Because we still want to have the um um. There it is. I wonder how that came off. Anyway, I fixed it because we're going to start adding points to that bad boy. All right. So let's take a look at these. So um, on the job side, these make a lot of sense, right? Um, how many hours do I have to work? What's the pay and benefits, says Jake? Yeah, totally. Um, oh, that's Bridger. Jake then goes on to say, I think one of the most important guides, you know, I've is it intriguing? Are you interested in it? Because you're going to have to do it for the majority of your waking life. You might as well be interested in the work. I like it. Julie says, you know, is it something that you can see yourself doing, enjoying it? Yeah, totally. Uh, Maximus uh, uh, fulfills you, right? Yeah. You know, enjoy it kind of gives you a sense of, of purpose and it can retain your interest. Um, then, but so, and we're going to find another job, Brandley, um, opportunities within the job. Very good. Shane is, uh, is there potential for advancement, right? Is, is, is the job going somewhere? These are excellent, right? And so, yeah, you guys, uh, let's go ahead and, and add these on in and, uh, Let's see. Today, I want to do uh, this one. All right. But now, let's look at the answers to the question to the whole Desert Island thing, right? So, um, let's see. I know that Zach, here we go. Um, split up and go around the island to see what resources you have available and then focus on three main things needed to survive. Food, shelter, water makes good sense, right? Um, uh, Delina um, says uh, water collector for some sort of distillation equipment and so forth. So once again, we're looking at survival. We need some water. We need some equipment. Somebody needs to build that. We need somebody to build a fishing rod and do the fishing and so on. So yeah, you need these things as well. So now, Real quick, and I get mixed up on this. Um, here's the thing, guys. Um, ah, we'll come back here. It's the same question. It's the same question, right? So think about this for a moment. Just let it... You may not be on a desert island, but you sort of kind of are. You're, you know, you could say we're on island earth, but actually you probably don't have the whole world at your fingertips in terms of where you can build a career, right? You're probably thinking, well, United States, and maybe you're even thinking, I want to stay in Utah. And so really your ability to earn a living is really based on what are the needs of employers or customers or clients in this finite space, okay? And so what this means is that we're on the desert island. We're at the very beginning stages of creating a little mini society that we can then assign and allocate roles and resources to make sure that this little tiny society survives? Well, the only difference between that and right now is that we have a larger society and we already kind of have systems in place, but you still need to figure out what your role will be in this and whether or not you are providing a value that uh, is, is really needed is really necessary, okay? 
Um, Let's see. I overthought my answer, but uh, maybe to find whatever resources for food. Yes, exactly. Exactly. No, no. Totally cool. Totally cool. And, you know, even revising an answer gets the points. <laughs> okay. So let's continue on. This is what we want to explore here is is uh, Socrates here, and here's the only known picture of Socrates, just so you know. Um, He's asking a question, and the question is this, you know, what takes precedent? The interest of society, what we're going to call the state, right? So when we say the state in this reading, we just mean society. The interests of the state or the interests of the individual. So when you answered the question from the what are you going to do for your career? And by the way, I agree with all of your answers, even though I'm about to challenge them, I agree with them. So when you answered the question, you answered it in the sense of what's in it for me, 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 me. And trust me, folks, in building my own career, it's been pretty much what's in it for me, right? Now, I actually did make a shift to help society more because when I was working corporate, I felt less like I was making a meaningful contribution to society. I feel like as a professor, I make an increased contribution to society. So I did make kind of a shift. But the point of the matter is just the be clear. The answers are really around how can I find fulfillment for myself and my family and those close to me? Whereas what Socrates is saying is, well, gee, maybe what we need to be focusing on is what does the state need? And those who answered the question along the lines of the desert island, you were like, what does the state need? That's essentially what you said. It was like, hey, here are the things we need, food, water, and shelter. How are we going to allocate tasks to make sure that the society survives? You put the society first. The others put individual first. And that's a question that we're going to explore a lot in this whole course. By the way, Shane, uh, my last sentence, oh, is this going to be a stable career path that meets the needs of society? Okay, okay, okay. So, bam. Yeah. Um, am I pushing? Yes. Um, so yes, you're getting, you you got it, Shane, right? You're saying, is it a stable career for me that benefits society? That's why one of the reasons I shifted to academia, it was a stable career for me, 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 that benefits society. I'm here for you. Okay, so it's that balance. All right, there we go. Okay, so let's explore what these guys had to say about it. Um, Here's an assertion that Plato makes. Plato makes this assertion. He says, the individual, individuals are naturally inclined to seek their own self-interest. And that's what many of us do in our lives. We're seeking our own self-interest. But in order to do this, we have to form a society that supports the common good. So here's the idea, guys. You are seeking your own self-interest, and that's totally cool. Don't worry. But you need the society. You need the state, such as an educational system and researchers and scientific method and employers and a monetary system and um, safety and security. You need all of that, which is society, to pursue your own self-interest, right? Okay. So with that in mind, he then goes on to assert that ultimately justice arise arises from the need for cooperation, which is necessary to meet our individual self-interest. So in other words, in order to meet our self-interest, we have to support society. And in order for society to thrive, people need to be allowed to pursue their own self-interest. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if you will, right? Um, so let's explore this dynamic a bit. All right. Um, 
So what we're going to read here is a dialogue, all right? In this dialogue recorded by Plato, Socrates argues that as society grows and the population increases, there will be a greater demand for resources, including agriculture, grazing, all that stuff. So the bigger we get, the more we need. It's self-evident, right? He suggests that if a just and harmonious society is not maintained, individuals will be driven by their self-interest, they may resort to acquiring land by force, which can potentially lead to war, so on and so forth. So what he's arguing, we're going to see, is that in order for us to live in peace and harmony and pursue our self-interest, we need a just and an and equal society. Okay, let's see how, how they explore this. All right. First thing, this is in the Plato reading where he's talking about what Socrates says. All right, just so we know. An individual can't meet all their needs by themselves. So a state arises, as I conceive, out of the need of mankind. No one, no one is self-sufficing, but all have needs and wants. So I have needs and wants, but I can't provide all my needs and wants. In fact, and we're going to get into this, I can hardly support any of my needs and wants. I'm pretty darn useless, right? So, for example, um, every once in a while, um, I'm in the, a, a group where they say, hey, we want to take care of each other, so on and so forth. So, like, once a year, they they pass around this this sign-up sheet to say, hey, what skills and resources do you have in case of an apocalypse, right? If there's an earthquake, if there's a fire, if there's anything around that, um, um, it, can anyone tell me what song this is? Am I playing a song? I don't think I'm playing a song. In any case, they're, they're handing out the sign-up sheet. If there's a fire and an uh, earthquake, apocalypse, anything like that. Um, okay, I see now. What resources do you have What that you can bring? What skills? And so people will write, I have an ATV. Uh, I have a trailer. I have a truck. And somebody else says, I know CPR. Somebody else says, I know welding. And another person says, you know, I know electrical engineering and stuff like that. I always write on this list, I consume resources because that's what I do primarily. I consume resources. And so that's what Socrates is saying here is we can't do everything by ourselves. We need a state. We need a society. As we have wants, many wants, and many persons are needed to supply them, one takes a helper for one purpose and another for another, and these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation. The body of inhabitants is termed a state. Okay, fancy speak for we all start living together, not under the same room, but you know, under the same roof, but, you know, in little villages and then in cities and so on and so forth. This is the state. And we do this so we can support one another and get what we want. All right, cool. Sounds good. All right. So Socrates then goes on to say that each member of the state, all right, of the society, we really need to specialize. All right. He says the idea is called division of labor. Again, one of the most important ideas in economics today. Okay. Funny thing is he says economics today it's still one of the most important concepts, ideas in economics today. So with that, I want to ask you guys, I want to ask you this. What are the advantages to specialization, to division of labor? Why is it in the benefit of both society and ourselves to specialize? So let's take a couple of minutes and explore that one.
Okay, let's take a look at these. Very good. All right, Maximus, because it allows uh, science and technology to advance, right? If everybody is just a farmer, we wouldn't be able to advance. And in point of fact, with farming, it used to be that everybody farmed because that's what you need to eat. And now practically nobody farms and not nobody, but very, very, very few people farm. And we make tons of food because of technological advancement. I like it. Uh, Bridger specialization and professions allow society to grow and get things done. Yes, we're going to see this. You're absolutely correct. Um, we all have different talents and expertise. If we don't share our talents, we can't benefit one another in society. So yes, I mean, bam, three there right away. So not only are you right, I want to show you something. And gosh, there it is. Um, I want to show you how right you are. Um, this is what Socrates says. We must infer that all things are produced more plentifully and easily and of better quality when one man does one thing which is natural to him and does it at the right time and leaves, uh, you know, leaves others to other things and so forth. By the way, Faith says uh, specialization can help each person know what they are good at right? Oh, very. I like that, right? And, you know, gain all the knowledge and so forth. You're, you're absolutely, and that's not the one I want. <laughs> it's, it's funny. So I have this really cool, you know, stream deck here, but if you don't have the right window selected, stream deck brings up some crazy stuff. Um, so, guys, check this out for a moment. I, I want you to embrace an idea for just a second. All the answers that you gave there are what Socrates said. Can you, can you for a moment embrace the fact that you and Socrates are on the same plane. You're thinking about things the same way. You could sit down and have an intelligent conversation about specialization and division of labor with Socrates. You're good. Embrace what you know and challenge what you know and accept that you can think things through in a way that one of the greatest thinkers in the world can. Okay? Just, I just want to point that out. Okay? Uh, specialization saves time. Oh, yes. Indeed. It saves a lot of time. Yeah. That's one of the big, big Okay, let's keep going. Um, so, within a city, how will we exchange things? Well, now this is what creates the need for a marketplace. Because, okay, now we've got ourselves a little society, all right? A little village, a little city. Everybody is specializing but then you need these resources, you need these skills, you need the things that people build, you need their services. Um, how are you going to get them? You're going to get them by going to a marketplace. Now, this is really, it hasn't changed where the marketplace is and how it works technologically evolves but when you want something, you either go to the store or you go to Amazon or you go to KSL. If I want to sell something, I've been selling some things recently on KSL. I go to the marketplace. Or if I want to sell, if I want to sell my shirt, hey, you wish, you wish you had a cool shirt like this, right? Caffeine, brain in caffeine. I can do that online. I go to the marketplace. Okay. So this is 
I, I mean, this is obvious to us, but this is where the ideas first come up about. Now, they're going to challenge it pretty soon. Don't worry. We're going to have a wet blanket come in with Aristotle here in a moment, and he's going to kind of lose things a little bit, right? And once again, you're as smart as, as Socrates. What he says is, listen, he goes on to argue that the more commerce that takes place, the more additional professions are needed. Okay, so, you know, seafarers, merchants, toolsmiths, etc., all of these come about and can create greater wealth and luxury for everyone. And the more commerce we have, the more professions we need. So just so you know, there's not a finite number of jobs out there. Nobody's coming to take your job. Now, we're going to talk about this because your job can disappear. But in a job disappearing, more jobs are created. We've, there are hundreds and millions of jobs out there, and we're going to be creating more and more. You guys will be building your careers around professions that do not yet exist. I absolutely promise you this. And Socrates is making that same point right here. Okay? So, check this out. He says, the question which you uh, have me consider is not only how a state, but how a luxurious state is created. You know, I suspect that many will not be satisfied with a simpler way of life. They will be adding sofas and tables and other furniture, also dainties and perfumes and incense and courtesans and cakes. And I don't have many courtesans, but, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. Um, You know, we have to go beyond the necessities, he's saying. People are not going to be satisfied with living down here. They want, they want their, their wealth to grow and their luxuries to grow all the more. So that brings us to our next question. Where do you see examples of this today? Where do you see examples of people, you and me especially, where do you see examples of you and me seeing something that in the past was really kind of cool, but today is mundane and we actually are looking forward to the next level of luxury. Give me some examples of that. Okay, let's take a look at this. 
I really like these. So um, we've got uh, um, Bridger saying modern transportation. This is such a good example, right? We can travel places today in a matter of hours that would take years or months before, right? Yes. And yet, and yet you take, say, like a flight, for example, there was a time that flight was like, wow, this is amazing. And now it's like, that is the most freaking miserable experience ever. I don't fly. I hate flying. I want it better. Right. Just really good example. Uh, Maximus, the best thing I can think of is Amazon. We used to be, you know, go to the store to grab our stuff or go through eBay. And now with Amazon, we still um, want our package faster and faster. That is a super good example too, right? Um, Yeah, it's now with Amazon, it's like, I have to wait two days for this? That kind of blows. Why can't I have it overnight? An example I'll give you is, I think I shared with you, yeah, I shared with you that my father recently passed away. And so I have all his stuff. Now, he doesn't, he didn't have much stuff. He didn't have much stuff at all. But he did have some camera equipment. And one of the cameras he has is a Sony A77. Now, 11 years ago, this Sony A77 was the hottest most amazing DSL camera you could get. I mean, just extraordinary camera. Uh, Like a $2,300 camera, $2,300. Today, I can't, I can't give it away hardly. I've tried to sell it. I've brought, I started it at you know, 300 with a bunch of lenses. I took it to 250 with a bunch of lenses. No, no, because today's cameras are much better and much faster and the lenses are cooler, so on and so forth. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep the camera and use it myself. I can't even really use it myself because I'm used to these really nice E-mount cameras and so forth. So it's amazing how much this this grows and so forth. Absolutely. Okay, let's come back on over here then. Um, we then must enlarge our borders. So now he's saying, and I won't read all this one. He's saying, okay, well, here's the thing. If we want more and more, and there are more and more people wanting more and more luxury and cool stuff and dainties and courtesans, um, we need to enlarge our borders. We need more space. We need more resources. And unless um, you go to war, how are you going to get this? Well, now in the past, war was the way to go. But you know what? You don't have to go to war. And this is kind of the, the premise that Plato is making is we need to develop just societies so that war and force is not the answer to getting the things that we we want to need, right? We want a slice of our neighbor's land. We'll want their pastor, pastor and so on and so forth. This can't abide, right? So, you have to ask yourself, and we'll we'll keep kind of moving on here. We're getting short on time. Um, you know, how can we get what we want without going to war? And the answer is trade. Now, I teach another class. I teach a class called uh, Management 1060, International Business. And the whole premise of global trade is to get the resources we need in return for the resources we have in abundance so that everybody can get what they need without us going to war and so forth. So that's why we set up trade zones and or, you know, trade agreements. There we go. And we set up the World Trade Organization and so forth. These are all mechanisms by which we can buy and sell what we need without having to, well, yeah, go to war and take these things by force. So we're going to see that business has the real opportunity to 
to create a just world if we let it. And as we're going to see in this course, it's freaking hard and we're not always successful, if ever. Okay. Um, okay. Now, what we've done here through Plato and Aristotle is we're creating wealth. We're creating a ton of wealth. We're creating all of this cool luxury stuff. And this kind of freaks Aristotle out. So we're going to see how it freaks Aristotle out. But first, I need a stretch break. So we're going to do a stretch break. Our stretch break today, get up wherever you are and so forth and do it with me. We are going to have a dance break. Let's dance. There you go. A good dance break. Ah, I get tired sitting here and so forth. Julie, I'm glad you liked that. Let's go ahead and yes. Ah, we need that now and again. Let's go ahead and come back over here so you can see the light bulb you just earned. Yeah, you got to get up and move, folks. And if you were alone at home, and thought to yourself, this is silly. I'm not going to do it. You need to get over it. You need to get over yourself. This is the way to triumph in the world. Own who you are. Do it. Go out there. Kick ass. Take names. And to heck with everyone else. Brandy Lee liked it too. So there you go. All right. Let's come back over here. And here we go. Okay. Aristotle, the wet blanket. But he brings up good points, so let's not hate on the guy too much, right? So we'll come over here. This is what Aristotle says. He says, listen, this is fine and so forth, but he draws what he feels is an important distinction, all right? He talks about something called... Um, well, he talks about the art of, of household management and the art of money making. The art of household management involves managing a household and its resources. This includes activities such as acquiring and maintaining property as is necessary to meet your needs, managing finances, overseeing, you know, well-being of your family members. This is all mwah, French, French kiss, Italian kiss, ah, kiss. This is all good stuff. By contrast, the art of money making involves the acquisition and management of wealth, wealth accumulated for its own sake rather than 
as a means. Okay, let's kind of look at what the dude's talking about here, all right? He argues that household management, this is honorable and necessary. You know, taking care of your house, taking care of your family, making sure everybody's, you know, safe and secure, all that good stuff. He likes it. Um, but he says that the money making, making the accumulation of money rather than the accumulation of of household security and so on and so forth, this really bothers him. So let's talk through what he says. All right. And give him let's give him a minute, right? He says, of everything which we possess, it has two uses. Both belong to the thing as such, but not in the same manner and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so we've got a primary use and a secondary use. So he says, for example, a shoe. This is a shoe. Shoe. For example, shoe. It, it can be used to wear. You can wear the shoe and it can be used as a medium of exchange, a means of exchange. Both are uses of the shoe. He who gives a shoe in exchange for money or food to him for wants it does indeed use the shoe as a shoe, but this is not the proper or primary purpose of a shoe, is not made to be an object of barter. Okay, so what's he say? He says, this shoe is meant to be worn. The value that this shoe brings about is that it can protect your feet while you work and create and work on the house and do your job and so on and so forth. The value this shoe was intended to create is protecting your feet so you can be productive. You can also use it as a medium of exchange, an object of barter, buy and sell it, but that's not what it was created to do. That is not its natural purpose. Okay? All right. So, the same can be said of all possessions. He's talking about shoes, but the same can be said of all possessions. For the art of exchange extends to all of them. And it arises first from what is natural, from the circumstances that have, too, you know, that some have too little, others too much. And this sort of barter is not necessarily part of wealth getting art um, and is not contrary to the nature, but needed for the satisfaction of men's natural wants. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying it's totally cool to buy and sell shoes and food and anything else to use. And if you have a whole bunch of shoes, but you have no food and somebody else has a whole bunch of food and no shoes, you can totally trade. And this is normal and natural and not contrary to natural survival. Okay. He's totally cool with this. So, the thing is, he doesn't like the idea of accumulation of wealth for wealth's sake. Now, if you're getting, if you're working and taking care of your own and your family and all that, that's cool. But the idea of accumulating wealth to him seems unnatural. Here's how he puts it. Some maintain that coined money is a mere sham, a thing not natural but conventional only. Because if the user substitutes another commodity for it, it is worthless. And because it is not useful as a means to any of necessities of life, and indeed, he who is rich in coin may often be in want of, or ne of necessary food, but, he, um, but how can that be wealth which a man can have in great abundance and yet perish of hunger. Okay, what's he saying? I'm going to get rid of my shoe. He's saying, so listen, if you have a bunch of food, good news, you can eat it. You're going to survive. If you have a bunch of clothing, good news, you can wear it. You're not going to freeze to death. Um, if you have a bunch of money, 
it's as an entity, it is worthless. Okay? As a thing itself, it is worthless. Now, I have another video. I think it's included in Canvas, but it's definitely a nutshell brainery um, talking about how money is fake. Money is a lie. So would you like to know more? Check out the video about money being fake. OK. But in this case, he's saying, listen, you can't eat money. You can't wear money. You can't do anything with money. And so the only value money has is if somebody else is willing to exchange for it. Now, I know this seems odd to us, but, you know, play with the idea a little bit. Now, this takes me to our next segment. We're going to play a game. It's called What's in the Box? Okay. I've got a box here. There's something in the box. There's a bunch of something. It's the same thing. Um, what's in the box? Give me your guesses. Understand that we're talking about money is fake and it has no value. It's, it's a lie. It's a sham, according to Aristotle, right? Like the Midas fable, whose insatiable prayer turned everything that was set before him into gold. Great, you got a ton of gold. What good is it? You're going to starve to death. What's in the box? Give me your guesses. What's in it? We're gonna open it up. What's in here? A bolt, a key. The key's right here. I do have a key, but it's not a key. A block. Not quite. We're talking about how money is fake. Come on, folks. We're talking about how money is fake. It's money. Don't worry, you still get the light bulbs for the... All guesses get light bulbs, right? Ooh, and we got a new one here. All right. Okay. A coin. Lots of coins. Here's the thing. I actually have, and this is just a few. Um, I have a ton of foreign money from... Uh, from around the world. <laughs> Foreign money from around the world. Um, because I, I used to travel a lot. I, I've lived in... Okay, fake money. Hold on to that thought, okay? Um, I, I've lived abroad and, and I've, I used to travel a lot and so I'd pick up the money. And of course, you come home with these pockets full of money and so on and so forth. And it's just such a pain in the ass to exchange... Once you're back over stateside, even if you're back in that country, it's a pain to exchange. So you just bring it home. And, and, and I, so I have a big, big folder full of money. I probably have close to $1,000 in foreign money, but it's useless to me. Okay, this is from, uh, these are five RMBs from, or Remy from Malaysia, each of five. Um, this is a 20 pound. So this is 20 quid, 20 pounds from the UK. That's, that's like 30 bucks right there. Um, whole bunch of coins here. I have a coin from Costa Rica. Um, I have a coin from Thailand. I have a coin from, I don't know where that's from. Um, hey, hey. An American quarter. That actually has value here. Um, and then I have some money. These are yuan 
from China. Now, why have I put it in this little bag? Because even if I go to China, this note and these coins are useless. They have since changed the currency from when I was working in Shanghai. And so even if I go to the country where this is from, um, it's useless. So I've got over a thousand bucks of money from around the world that is such a pain in the butt to exchange that I don't even bother doing it. It's just kind of fun to have around. That is literal fake money, right? It's just paper and coins and stuff that I throw in a box and play with in a game now and again. So yeah, let's come back here. All right. Um, so now this is an interesting one. Over here, put the game away for a moment. Just a moment. Just a moment. Okay. Check this out. This is what Aristotle says. When the use of coin had been discovered out of barter of necessity articles arose the other art of wealth getting, namely retail, retail trade, which was at first probably a simple matter. Okay, let's, let's pause for a moment there, okay? At first, a simple matter. Money actually serves a super, super, super valuable purpose, right? Which is, it is a way of trading value of objects uh, with people that may not necessarily ha need what you have or vice versa. So for example, so for example, um, my father had a telescope, big, 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 huge ass telescope. I don't do telescope stuff and so forth. And I'm not going to be able to trade this. I don't know. So I went to KSL, found a guy who was into telescopes. He paid me money. I gave him the telescope. And now I can take that money and buy a mic that I want. Actually, I'm going to pay a I'm going to pay a student loan payment with it. But you get my point, right? So it's a way of extracting value from something in some in in a form that can then be used to, you know, for somebody else to get value out of. Okay. It's simple. It's really simple. So as he says, it probably pretty simple, but became more complicated as soon as men learned by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Okay. This is key. Exchange from what you and I do, hey, I'll give you a dollar for a candy bar or something like that. That's a very simple exchange, right? But that's not how the money is made. The money is made, if your major is finance and so on and so forth, the money is made in these insanely complicated exchanges that become seriously bizarre and weird. So if you have Netflix, if you have Netflix, watch the movie, The Big Short. The Big Short is now on Netflix. You need to watch The Big Short. It attempts to explain the housing market boom and bust of 2009, okay? Ask your parents about this, this bubble bursting and they will tell you horror stories, all right? And this is a very good, very funny movie that tries to take a very complicated exchange and put it in layman terms that you and I can understand. So do yourself a favor and, and watch that movie. Okay. Um, Aristotle seems to argue that a good life is one in which rather than wanting what we don't have, we learn to want what we have. As Seneca says, it's not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. I buy into that, by the way. I buy into that, okay? Um, we're not going to worry about that. Well, I'm just going to read the Lawn's translations. You can look at the top stuff later. I want to leave time open for questions and so on and so forth. Um, let's see. 
Running a household takes money, but it would stand to reason that we should work to make more money or at least conserve what we have to support household operations. He's cool with that. But money is becoming the measure of one's wealth uh, and, by extension, one's personal value since it is a measure of how successful we are in business. So, for example, and this is going to be our last question, so chime in on this question and let's get these light bulbs up there, right? Here's our last question. Why is it considered inappropriate to ask someone or even tell someone how much they earn? Why is it considered inappropriate to ask someone how much do you earn, especially if you're a professional salaried employee? Some companies forbid it, although that's a different lecture for a different class, Management 1070, where we talk HR. But why is it considered inappropriate or even rude to ask someone how much they make? And why is it even distasteful to brag or tell someone how much you make? Let's play with that as our last question. Okay, very good answers here. So, uh, because the amount someone gets paid isn't what they are worth as an employee, because their worth shouldn't be measured by dollars. Um, I think it's a hushed topic because money is so intertwined with our economy and not everybody wants to talk about it. Yeah, especially if they, you know, see us differently as a result. You can also measure money as someone experience measure money versus someone's experience. I like that. The the two may not correlate. Um, people make assumptions and judgments based on your wealth, therefore inappropriate. I think others may gain an opinion about the person based on their money, and it may not be an accurate opinion. So yes, yes, totally. And that gets us up there. There we are. Very, very good. So, yeah, here's here's the concern that, and, and you're perfectly articulating it. Aristotle has some interesting 
maybe out their feelings about natural wealth and and the art of getting money and money being fake, although it is, you know, and how it's useless. It's not. But his overall thesis is that we should not value ourselves or value each other based on something like money. This is what he finds most egregious, most immoral, most vile, is that we would use this fiction called money to value human beings and their worth to society, and that we would form opinions about people based on a, a, an arbitrary number. And so this is what concerns him the most. And, uh, and yeah, I buy into that. I buy into that. Um, it's also like questioning someone's expertise and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. All right, guys, fantastic work. Very good work. Um, we only have a few minutes left, 15 minutes or so. And so I like to use this time to answer any questions you may have. Um, anything at all, go ahead and start typing and so forth. Um, pretty straightforward this week. If you have any questions that you would rather go over in a private Zoom, let me know and we can we can take care of that. Um, otherwise, I am going to stick around. I will be here answering questions in the chat. So if you have anything, throw it in there. But in the meantime, um, yeah, excellent. Oh, can't find it. <laughs> I need to be more organized about this. That's what I need to do. I need to be more organized. Yeah, good luck. I keep adding things. And so when I add things, I forget where the old things were and so forth. I'll stick around. In the meantime, have a fantastic day, and we will see you next week.